So, okay, so I know that I could put this in slideshow mode, but I don't like doing that because I like to see I'm blind as a bat. <laughs> I need to see what I'm doing. So I like having the slides in front of me. So anyway, what I wanted to do today was just to talk a little bit about uh, the conversation that Peter had last week about uh, tapping a transformer, putting a one turn tap on a transformer to um, uh, measure, to characterize his crystal filter. So, and as usual, I encourage people, you know, to go outside of their comfort zone and challenge things and uh, learn things. Because uh, by me doing this, going and investigating this, I learned a, a little bit about uh, what it means when you tap a transformer um, with uh, uh, the impact. So this came about from a, uh, a radio that Pete and I built uh, a couple of years ago. We called it back then the Dueling 612. And basically it's got a crystal filter and it's got two transformers and it's got two SA612s. And uh, the SA612 impedance is 1500 ohms. Crystal filter is about 200 ohms. So you need a transformer to match uh, that impedance. And uh, um, we did that. And so Peter wanted to characterize that filter. And so he thought of putting a turn on these transformers and tapping it to, to see what was going on. And uh, that that's because our signal, our um, uh, tracking generator and our spectrum analyzer is 50 ohms. It's not 1500 ohms or 200 ohms. So, you know, ideally what we'd want to do is change this transformer to be a 200 ohm to a 50 ohm uh, transformer, connect our tracking generator. And the same thing here, go from 200 ohms to 1500 ohms and put your SA on that side. And that way you could characterize that crystal filter. So, you know, Peter and I talked about it and so we, you know, I, he suggested putting a turn on the transformer. And I said, well, you know, off the cuff kind of thing. I said, hey, you know, why don't you just put a resistor in series with the, uh, like put a 1400 or 1500 ohm, 1450 ohm, a resistor in series with the SA and the tracking generator. And that way you're not changing the impedance this crystal filter is going to see. So that was kind of off of the cuff. Uh, sorry so to interrupt kind of you. Uh, can you go in presentation mode? It will be helpful to see those blocks very closely. I'm uh, sorry, I didn't catch that. Uh, can, can you go in presentation mode uh, on on the PowerPoint so that the slide will be bigger? Yes, I, I, as I said, I'd rather not do that okay. because I like to see what uh, what slides are coming. Okay, okay, no problem. So I prefer not not to not to do that. I can uh, do that, but as I said, I'm a little bit blind, and I need to see what's coming up. Okay, so so the uh, so what this is this is not to talk about how transformers work. It's not about deriving transformer equations. Just accept them. Here's the equations, you know, and uh, I'm gonna uh, I'm not gonna be talking about these equations. I'm not gonna be doing a lot of math. It's this is more of a high level discussion of uh, what's going to happen more. So I'm taking a view of a approach of physics because my background is physics. And so when I look at the world, I see physics. So if you look at symbol physics, you know, the there are some laws of thermodynamics. I'm not going to get into this a whole lot, but uh, you know, the first law of thermodynamics says, you know, it's about conservation of energy. You can't create or destroy energy. So if you look at a transformer, whatever energy, whatever power you put into a transformer has to come out of it, assuming there are no losses. If you've got an ideal transformer and you have no losses, it's a perfect transformer, whatever power you put in has to equal the power coming out. And if it doesn't, then you could make a perpetual motion machine or the world is flat, an alien shot JFK. Like it's, this is a law of physics. It's, it's, it's immutable. It's a law 
it, uh, it's been proven. You can't uh, deny that. So what does this mean? What does this mumbo jumbo mean about the laws of thermodynamics? Well, here's a simple transformer. If we put power in, we should see the power out if there are no losses. So here's a simple little circuit. I did an LT spice and I'm transforming a 200 ohm impedance crystal filter uh, impedance to 1500 ohms, which is the, um, the SA612. And this transformation, this uh, ratio of, in, of inductance here or impedance here is going to dic dic dictate what the um, impedance transformation of source and load is going to be. So I just happen to choose 200 to match this to 1500. It doesn't matter. Uh, I know Ken will be doing a talk later on about transformers, and he will talk to you about what the minimum you know, um, uh, uh, inductance needs to be for these uh, 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 transformers to work properly in a broadband sit situation. So stay tuned for, for that. But if you just use 200 microhenries and 1500 microhenries or 200 millihenries and 1500 millihenries, it doesn't matter. It's the ratio of these two numbers to the ratio of those two numbers has to match. Here's another situation where it's the same ratio of impedances and this ratio is the same as that ratio. So here's a plot of the power going into the transformer. So voltage times current RMS. Well, this is actually showing the, uh, um, the, the real um, uh, waveform of it. But if you look at the RMS values, that'll give you the actual uh, power in. So here we're looking at the power going in. Here's the power coming out. And if we look at the power going in, power coming out, it's the same. 7.5 milliwatts going in, seven, sorry, 7.9 milliwatts going in, 7.9 milliwatts coming out. That's what the first law of thermodynamics is saying, that the power in must be equal to the power out. Okay, so what about impedance transformation? So here's a little trick in LT spice you can do. Uh, some of you may be aware of that. So you take your voltage source and instead of feeding a voltage, you're going to use an AC voltage. So an RMS AC voltage, and you're going to use an AC sweep. You're not doing a transient sweep. You're use, using an AC sweep now. And if you plot the voltage divided by the current, so you plot voltage at VP divided by the current flowing in this uh, section here, that's the current going through the voltage source or the current going through the inductor L1. You divide those that uh, the voltage by that Ohm's law. That's that's the impedance. That'll be the impedance seen on this side of the transformer, reflected by this side of the transformer. So we terminate the transformer here at 200 ohms, and what are we going to see here? What's the impedance we see here? So if you do this in LT spice, you change the scale on the left-hand side here. You uh, right-click on that and you change the vertical axis scale and you go from decibel to linear and it'll show you the value in ohms. Now, I just happen to choose two frequencies, uh, 3.7 megahertz, uh, 28.7 megahertz. You'll see it's 1.5K, 1500 ohms which is exactly what we would expect. So this side of the transformer is seeing 1500 ohms, which is the reflection of this 200 ohm uh, in, um, load that uh, is going to going through the transformation, impedance transformation from this, this transformer. Makes sense. Okay, so, uh, so now the other side. So let's do the same thing at the other side. Let's terminate the other side with 1500 ohms. And let's looking at this side, do the exact same thing. So we're gonna terminate this side of the transformer. And we're gonna look in this side of the transformer and see what impedance we see. And sure enough, it comes out 200 ohms. 
And if you look at the difference, it looks larger, but it's not. It's about an ohm difference. You know, it's just the scale is magnified. So it makes it look huge, but it's not. So the difference between 3, uh, 3.7 megahertz and 28.7 megahertz is one ohm difference. Same thing with the prior plot. It's one ohm difference. So that's the way a normal transformer works. So now what happens when you go and you tap it? So you've got your primary, you've got your secondary, you're now introducing turns here, whether it's one or 10 or whatever, you're tapping this, you're putting in another turn inside here. So here's another way of showing it. And here are some ratios. I'm not going to go through this, but this is how you would determine the voltage. Uh, you know, that's, um, uh, that's going to be reflected across this uh, transformer based on the turns ratio. It's very complex. It's not something that's easy, just a ratio. You'll see this is based on uh, V1 and V2 to, with the turns, and you got to look at N1 and N3, and it, it gets uh, rather cumbersome. And if you look at the current transformation, the current transformation is the sum of the other two transformation. So the current that's coming in, coming out of V of the secondary and this uh, tertiary winding is the sum when multiplied by the turns ratio of the current coming in here. So this gets quite complex. So let's take a look at how this plays out. So I, um, I'm going to show a one turn, a one turn tap later on, but just for the sake of argument, let's do a 50 ohm tap here. So we're going to put in 50 micro Henry's here, uh, another coil, and we're going to link them all together. And that's going to be, you know, we think it's going to be 50 ohms, then 200 ohms, 1500 ohms. And let's take a look at what we actually see. So let's look at the power. So we know that the power coming in must be the power coming out. So the sum of the power coming out here must be equal to the power coming in. It must. Okay, so let's take a look at that. Here's the power coming in, the primary power. Here's the power for the secondary in blue. And you can't see it because it's hidden behind the red. And the red is from the tap. Now, if you look at the power, you'll see 71 microwatts is going in. 35 microwatts is coming out of the secondary and 35 microwatts is coming out of the tertiary, coming out, out of the, the tap. Now, if you look at the sum of these two powers is equal to that power, everything's good, and our buddy Isaac Newton is happy because we haven't violated the laws of therm thermodynamics. The power in is equal to the power coming out, but now the power is shared. It's no longer the tap, by, by putting this tap in here, you're changing how much power is delivered to the load here, to your actual load. So what about the current? Let's take a look at the current. So if we measure the current coming into the primary and the current coming out of this uh, tertiary, the tap, and the current coming out of the uh, secondary here, and we apply this formula, we'll see everything's golden. We get, uh, you know, we multiply it by the turns ratio and uh, you'll see the, the magnitude of what's going in is coming out. Now, the way I came up with the turns is I assume this was a, a, um, a FT3743 toroid core and I went to the kits and parts calculator. I plugged in 1500 micro -hen henries and I said, okay, what's the turns that's going to give, give me that? and it's 58.4 turns. And uh, for uh, 50 micro -hen henries, it's 10.7. And for 200 mics, it's uh, uh, 21.3. So if we take those numbers, multiply them out, everything's good. And we're, we're close enough for government work. And our buddy Isaac Newton is happy. Okay, so what about the impedance transformation? This is where it gets very, very interesting. Okay, when you do these this this tapping, and so all of a sudden the physics is no longer simple. You get into really complex stuff. 
here. So if we look at the impedance now here, that's reflected back from the impedance, this 200 ohm impedance here, and this 50 ohm impedance here, reflected back from this transformer to this coil, and it's being presented here. So we're looking at the impedance here, seen here, when these two um, turns are uh, terminated. What do we see? Well, we're seeing 749 ohms. We're not seeing 1500 ohms. We're seeing half. We're seeing 749 ohms coming in. And again, we're seeing that both at uh, 3.7, 28.7, we're seeing the same thing. So let's, what about looking in the secondary? What do we see? Same thing, we're seeing half. The impedance now has dropped half. We're no longer, this transformer is no longer matching 200 ohms to 1500 ohms, right? And the same thing is if we look now at the 50 ohm tap, we're seeing 20, 25 ohms, we're seeing half. So all of a sudden, this thing, it's the math is no longer working out here. Now, the reason impedance transformation is important for a crystal filter is, uh, and I'm going to um, talk a little bit. Here's a program I wrote back in 2018 to analyze a crystal filter. This is called a Cohen filter, and it's based on this design here. And you plug in your crystal motional parameters and a coupling capacitors you put in, and you could do some plots. You can uh, uh, change the impedance on this input and output, and you could see what happens to your crystal filter when you change your impedance, or you could get it to optimize what the Z is or calculate what the design is, uh, uh, calculate what the termination, the ideal termination is for this crystal with those motional parameters. I won't get into this, but the only reason why I'm showing this is I want to show you what happens to a crystal filter when you change the impedance. So in the case of the crystal filter where it's not terminated, there's no termination, and you sweep it, you actually see the, the resonance, you see the, the peaks of the, the crystals. And you got a lot of ripple in the pass band, and that's just because of the crystals. The, um, the Q, it's a sharper Q, it's not loaded. So here we are, we apply 200 ohm termination at either end of the crystal filter, and we see a much more better, uh, like a Gaussian type curve. Incidentally, the orange curve is a Gaussian fit to that data. It's showing what the uh, Gaussian should, if it was a Gaussian, that's what it should look like. So you could see what's here, the actual plot doesn't even come close to a Gauss, Gaussian curve. Here it's getting close to a Gaussian curve, and we're seeing we're not getting much ripple in the pass band. And if we terminate it with 100 ohms, see we're getting a little bit more ripple in the pass band, and the skirts are now changing. So by you changing the termination of your crystal filter, you're changing the characteristics of that term, that crystal filter. So let's go and talk about Peter's specific case of adding one turn. So I think he used a 50, uh, FT5073, and so I put one turn, which comes out, if you use the kits and parts calculator, comes out to 3.1 micro -hen henries, and uh, 18 turns, that comes out to 1,004, and seven turns, is 151. So these are all the turns that Peter used in his uh, transformer. So if we take, take a look at the energy now, so the power that's being fed in here and the power that's coming out here, let's see if this tap is draining a lot of the power coming out of this tap. Now, in the case of crystal filter, this doesn't really matter because the crystal filter is not going to change based on power, right? It doesn't matter what power is coming in here. As long as we know what the power is, you know, we could calculate what the performance of that uh, crystal filter is. So, so if we plot the power coming in, plot power coming out of the tap, power coming out of the uh, uh, secondary, 
we see that you know we have 78, uh, 79 microwatts going in, and we have 73 microwatts coming out of the secondary. Not bad. We're getting almost all the power coming out. So the tap is only consuming six microwatts. So the tap is uh, consuming six. It's taking away six microwatts from this. So and if you add up all these numbers, they're going to add up because of the first law of thermodynamics. So from an impact of power transfer, that one tap is not really making a huge difference. So what about impedance? OK, so let's measure the impedance seen here. It should be 1,500 ohms. And here we should see 50, well, we're going to see something. It's one turn, not sure what it's going to be. And here we should see, uh, you know, 200 ohms. So if we measure the impedance looking in here, we see uh, 1,200 ohms, 1 1.22 K ohms, which is pretty close to 1,500 ohms. So we're not too far off, right? Now, I repeated the same thing, the same measurement by using this uh, voltage source on each of these sides. I've omitted showing individual slides for it. But if you look at the, this is the secondary. So you're looking in here at the secondary, you're seeing 207 ohms. So it's off a little bit, you're off by seven ohms, not too bad. So seven ohms is not gonna impact the crystal filter. It's not gonna load it down a lot. So that shouldn't make a big difference on the performance of the crystal filter. Uh, however, if you look at the, the impedance looking in here, it's two ohms. So you've got a 50 ohm device connected to two ohms. It's basically a short. So in the case of a your spectrum analyzer, you've got a two ohm source feeding a 50 ohm load, which is okay. Because well, it's not okay. You're gonna get some, you you can you're gonna get an SWR mismatch, but you're you're going to still see the appropriate, uh, um, I don't want to say power, but you're going to see the appropriate signal coming out of here. You're not loading it down. However, if you put your tracking generator and you connect your 50 ohm tracking generator to this, you're shorting out your tracking generator. Your tracking generator is going to see a 2 ohm uh, load, so it's basically a short. 50 ohms feeding two ohms is a short. So this is that's not a good idea to use a one turn tap for your uh, tracking generator because it's basically a short. So, so bottom line here is what Peter did for making a measurement, it's fine. For tapping it, making a measurement, I don't think it's gonna impact the crystal filter that much, but if you're using it to feed your tracking generator and you're feeding it in, I, your measurements are going to be off because it's going to be, you're basically shorting out your tracking generator. Now, if you're looking at relative measurements, I don't think it's going to make a difference because, you know, relative measurements are, are okay. You're comparing like uh, one measurement to another. It's going to be the same, but making an absolute measurement, I don't think you could do that. So, uh, you know, we all would agree the best approach is to put a 50 ohm to 1500 ohm transformer or a 50 ohm to 200 ohm transformer and then connect your spectrum analyzer or your tracking generator to the 50 ohm side of that transformer. This is the ideal case. So off the cuff, I said, you know, why don't you just add a resistor in series? So here's your tracking generator. It's 50 ohms. So if you add 1450 ohms to that tracking generator. So you've got 50 ohms in series with 1450 ohms. So that's 1500 ohms. So what your primary is gonna see here is 1500 ohms. Now I'm assuming that this is purely resistive. There's no complex, there's no, um, you know, uh, complex uh, impedance is purely real. Uh, so the tracking generator is gonna be real 50 ohms. And, uh, you know, we could put in a real 50 ohm, a 1450 ohm resistor here. 
And then on the other side, um, same thing. You put a 1450 ohm uh, resistor in series with your tracking generator. Now this forms a voltage divider, and it's going to basically short out what this tracking uh, the spectrum analyzer is going to see. And this this is just a wonky, you know, um, simulation I did where I just put a 200 ohm load here to simulate the the spectra the uh, crystal filter. I didn't bother putting in you know, actual crystals and, you know, all that stuff to simulate the crystal filter. I just put a resistor. I assumed it's a real uh, uh, load. It's a real 200 ohm load. And I put, put that there just for the sake of this simulation. So if we feed in a signal here, uh, you know, we get like, we get about 14, uh, 600, uh, what's that? Seven, 676 millivolts RMS feeding in here. And what's coming out? It's seven millivolts coming out. So if you look at the blue line, that's what's coming out. It's basically a short because you've got 1450 ohms, 50 ohms. This is a voltage divider. V out here is going to be really, really small because 50 ohms is almost like a short to, to 1450 ohms. But that's okay because if we look at this, you know, we have the 1450 ohm resistor feeding a 50 ohm uh, re resistor here. It's as if we've got a 29 dB attenuator. So the spectrum analyzer, it's going to be as if it's got a, a 29 dB attenuator here. Now, obviously, it's not matched to 50 ohms. So, you know, you'll get a, a higher SWR here. I don't think that's going to really matter because I don't think the spectrum analyzer is going to be too uh, concerned about a uh, reflection. And I think Hassan had said in a previous uh, meeting that as long as the traces, as long as this path here is much, much shorter than, than a wavelength, basically, you're, basically your reflection and your incident wave are going to be in phase. Now, I don't, that's another rabbit hole to, to go down, but... Uh, uh, but uh, that concludes what I wanted to say. So at that point, I'll terminate the presentation and I'll open up the floor for questions.